Well, thanks everybody for coming today. Welcome to Sci Starter Live. To start us off, I'm going to introduce um, us. <laughs> Um, I'm at Dr. Anna Funk. I'll be your host today. Um, also on the line today, we have Emma Giles, Sci Starters Program Coordinator, um, Roland Mandelak, who will be helping us, um, helping you guys get links, dropping links in the chat as we talk about cool Sci Starter resources and other things that we mentioned. Um, I will also note that the links that Roland's dropping in the chat will also be provided to you in a follow up email after the event. So don't feel like you have to have to um, frantically save them all. But um, I think that's all for our team. So one more note before we get started. I have one quick housekeeping note. So since this is, um, you know, an educational event, we're going to set some expectations just like we're in a classroom. So on the bottom of your screen on Zoom, you're going to see two separate buttons for chat and for Q&A. So you're going to use these for different things. So please use chat to share messages with each other. Um, you can use the to option to select your message recipient. So you can either send a direct message to IT support Roland if you need help, for instance. Um, otherwise, um, you can chat with everyone. Um, but if you have questions related to today's event, if you wanna ask questions about Narika, citizen science, things like that, please put them in the Q&A instead. So we'll do our best to answer all your questions at the end of today's event. Cool. So um, our guest speaker today is Anna Marie Rositska. Rositska, sorry, Anna. Um, she's a PhD candidate at Trinity College in Dublin. Um, has a degree in psychology, and has I should just let you um, share more about yourself, Anna. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, nice <laughs> to meet you. <laughs> Surely I can take over. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> so like, I don't uh, need to read I, this for you. You can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can read it myself. So I graduated in psychology and uh, I was previously also working as a user experience researcher at an IT company called Kentico Software. And uh, currently as a PhD candidate, I'm studying the risk factors for dementia, actually using Norica. And uh, I'm in general in love with all things health tech. So that's uh, why I focus on this topic. And I'm really happy to be talking about Nurika uh, with you here today. Awesome, thank you. So I just wanna ask really quick um, whether our guests today have ever participated in a citizen science project before. I know at these events we get old veterans, we get totally new people who are trying to get into citizen science for the first time. So there's gonna be a poll question it pops up on your screen in Zoom. And I would love to know if you've ever participated. Oh my gosh, we have 100% yes. Thank you for those of you who answered. Um, it's very exciting. So welcome back. Glad you're here. Next, I do wanna know if you've been to a SciStarter Live event before. So we've been doing these events for just couple weeks, couple months, time flies, um, but they're pretty new. Um, we're having a lot of fun doing them. So I would love to know which of you have come back and which of you are here for the first time. Ooh, about 50-50, cool. Well, welcome back to those of you who have been here before. Thanks for joining us. Um, by the way, if you want to see any recordings of past live events that you may have missed, they are all on YouTube. They're all linked on the SciStarter blog and you can also find them on SciStarter's YouTube page in the events playlist on YouTube. Cool. All right, last poll. I wanna know who you are. Um, sadly, you can only choose one. A lot of you might be multiple of these. Um, I'd love to know if you're a researcher yourself, if you're in education, random person on the internet who stumbled across this webinar. Awesome. Thanks for voting. We've got 50-50 aspiring citizen scientists and students. Cool. Thank you. Yay. 
Okay, so just a little bit about citizen science in general. I know you all said you've participated in projects before, um, but that could mean a lot of things. So we'll still talk a little bit about citizen science broadly. So citizen science is just a collaboration between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, or motivated to make a difference. So it's a really great way for people to make an impact on issues they care about, and it's all through helping science. So if you haven't already, your first step in becoming a pro citizen scientist would be to join SciStarter. Um, SciStarter is a research affiliate of Arizona State University. They host an active community of over 138,000 registered citizen scientists and have over 1,600 citizen science projects to choose from. So that sounds like a heck of a lot, but don't let that overwhelm you. It's pretty easy to narrow down what project you should participate in based on your interests and your location and all sorts of other factors. So if you want to create an account, you're just going to hit sign up on the top of the homepage. Um, it'll prompt you with like a menu with for personal information. And I will mention you, your zip code is optional, but if you put in your zip code, you'll get personalized recommendations for like your area, which is always cool. Um, when you're signing up, you can also check a box to get our email newsletter, which is also a fun way to find projects that um, we like extra, and um, this just comes out twice a month, the email newsletter. So uh, once you're signed up, you'll be ready to start looking for projects. So the best way to find projects is to hop over to the project finder. That's one of the, um, one of the buttons on the header there on the homepage. So, um, I also want to mention our first resource from SciStarter. So we have a free training on the foundations of citizen science. Um, by training, we mean it's like an online module. It's self-guided. It's super easy, but it's very interesting and informative. So um, on SciStarter.org, we have several free trainings like this that will really just set you up for success in any citizen science project. So anyone can complete them. When you finish them, you get a personalized badge like the one pictured here. Um, and it contains within it information that um, sort of proves you completed the training. Um, you can share it, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and this foundations training is the, actually a prerequisite for some of the other ones. So this is a great place to start. Um, if you're an educator, I don't think we had educators on the line, but in case anybody's watching this later, um, if you're an educator, trainings are a great resource for students. Um, your students can complete the training, um, which includes participating in two projects to get them started. Um, they can earn the badge, which they can send you as proof of completion. Um, it's really great. So um, I will also mention though that that does require students to have an account on SciStarter. So they do have to provide an email address for that. Okay. Once you're done with that, like I mentioned, there are other trainings that are really cool. The three others are on data literacy. One is on libraries as community hubs for citizen science. And the last one is about citizen science in higher education. Okay, down to business. I am so excited today to talk about Narika. I've been playing this for the past week in preparation for the game. It's kind of a thing. Um, so how we're going to get started, um, if you want to follow along, you can head over to the Narika project page on SciStarter.org. We're going to drop a link in the chat right now. Um, or if you're on the SciStarter homepage, you can literally just type Narika into the little quick navigate bar on the top of your screen. Um, OK, I think I'm going to hand it over to Narika here. Let me end my sharing. Doop. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'll just mm -hmm. quickly try to share my screen. Just a second. Okay. Um, can Looks you see good. it now? Mm -hmm. um, perfect. Yeah. So Hello again, everyone. Um, so um, I'll be introducing the Nurika project to you today. And um, 
I'm, uh, I would like to start actually by introducing the team behind Norica so that we know who we are, who's uh, kind of working on the thing on your screens. Um, so uh, this is the team. We are a team of researchers at uh, the Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. Um, we're um, called the Gillen Lab uh, at the Global Brain Health Institute here. And um, so um, there's quite a few researchers that we have, and we also, also have one sole brave developer um, implementing uh, all the features that we come up with. And uh, you can try to guess the PI on this picture. Um, our supervisor, Claire Gillen, she's actually here in the central center. Um, so she uh, was kind of the founder of Nurika. Um, unfortunately, our developer is not pictured here, but as you can see, it's quite a large research team and uh, just one uh, developer guy. So um, this is us. And uh, I will talk a bit about the context of why we're doing what we're doing for you so that you uh, get an idea of why to get involved at all and uh, what you can achieve. Uh, so we're going to be talking about brain health today. And uh, let me just briefly say uh, that this event has uh, mental health in its description, but uh, I'll talk about brain health in a more general sense. So by that, I mean not only uh, mental illnesses, but um, we also actually have quite a lot of features um, that focus on uh, dementia risk factors and dementia prevention. So uh, we'll be kind of tackling uh, those two areas um, together because that's what Neureka does. And uh, today I'll first talk a bit about um, what we already know about brain health. So um, there's actually quite a bit that research has shown already. Um, I'll also talk a bit about um, smartphone data and how uh, we can have a digital revolution thanks to smartphones uh, with regards to brain health research. And then uh, finally, I'll also talk about uh, how Norica comes into play and how you can use it to play, learn and track and help science that way. So firstly, um, poor brain health is quite common. So worldwide, uh, we know that about one in four people actually develop a mental illness across their lifespan, um, one point uh, in their lifespan, and all ages are affected. So it's not just teenagers or just uh, adults, but actually there's um, mental illnesses uh, that people suffer from uh, all over their lifespan. And uh, we also um, have some estimates that actually show that about one in five people who are over 50 um, might be at the continuum of uh, dementia. That means that they either might already have some uh, symptoms of cognitive impairment, or they might actually uh, go on to develop dementia later on in their lives. So um, problems with brain health are quite prevalent and that is pretty uh, scary. And at the same time, we also know that uh, poor brain health is costly. Um, so, the, the WHO says that uh, the leading cause of disability worldwide is depression. And um, we also know that um, the worldwide cost of depression is uh, about one trillion of US dollars per year. And uh, a similar sum is the uh, cost of dementia worldwide as well. So uh, just to give you an example of what a trillion actually means. So a trillion is a million millions. So um, let's say that for a million of dollars, you could buy a, a pretty nice apartment in San Francisco. Um, and if you have a million millions, then you could buy uh, such an apartment for every uh, inhabitant of San Francisco uh, for around a million people. So it's uh, quite a large sum of money. Um, and um, at the same time, though, research has shown already um, quite a few ways in which we can uh, help preserve our brain health and uh, prevent some problems in the future. So um, research has, for example, shown uh, or, or helped us estimate that up to 40% of all dementia cases could be either postponed or uh, prevented if we modify certain risk factors in our life. So uh, if you did some basic lifestyle changes. So for example, we know that about 8% of dementia cases could be attributed to hearing loss. 7% uh, could be attributed to uh, poor education and uh, about 5% actually could be attributed to, to something like smoking. So if we do things like um, encourage people to use hearing aids, um, 
if we provide primary and sec secondary education um, across the world and if we help people stop smoking, uh, then we could actually uh, have quite like cause quite a big impact across the world with regards to brain health. At the same time, the question is, how do we get this message out? So we know um, that there's a lot of things that people can change, but how do we get um, people all around the world to uh, learn what they can do? So um, lastly, uh, we also know that brain health research is challenging because brain health is a complex thing. There's a lot of things coming into play like culture, genetics, the lifestyle that I already mentioned, uh, social context, so a lot of different factors. Um, and so the risk factors for poor brain health are actually quite hard to study because you don't have very specific effects. Uh, so it's not like you have a gene and therefore you're gonna develop depression later on. Um, it's much more fuzzy to study. Uh, we also know that all the different risk factors have uh, usually quite small contribution to a risk of uh, poor brain health. And uh, we also know that the different factors um, interact with each other and change over time. So it's quite a complex set of relationships and uh, that makes it quite difficult to research. But at the same time, um, we know that big data could help us do this. So we need a lot of data to study those relationships and we need um, a, lot of, a lot of data also at an individual level. Um, so this is actually where our lab had a Eureka moment, as we call it. So uh, what if we could actually use the devices that are already in the pockets of people all around the world to study uh, brain health? We could do a digital revolution with smartphone-based research. And uh, this is for, um, useful for several reasons. So firstly, um, using smartphones, we can quite easily get really large samples of people, a lot of participants helping us with our research, which wouldn't be very feasible um, if we did um, in lab studies. Uh, second, we also can achieve a greater breadth of data. So we can quite easily ask people about a lot of different factors. Um, and this data can also be, uh, have greater depth. And by that, I mean that we can actually test people over time or uh, assess their brain health over time much more easily than if we had to invite them uh, to come to university over and over to do some uh, research. And lastly, we can also actually turn this into a two-way relationship and give insights back to you, the citizen scientists. Um, and that is insights about your own uh, well-being, but also insights about the things that you can change in your life um, to increase your chances at um, long-term brain health. So um, let's talk about who's already using Nurika and who actually Nurika is for. Um, so this uh, smartphone application is uh, freely available to download for iOS and Android. So uh, the only limitation is that you should be using a smartphone, not a tablet, um, because it's not um, at the moment ready for tablets really. Uh, but um, anyone really can uh, download Nurika and uh, try it out. Um, and we actually at the moment have a really wide age range of participants. We only use data from people over 18, but there's people um, of up to 100 years of age, and we have about a half of our participants are actually over 40. So uh, it's not just um, some uh, youngsters uh, on their phones, but it's uh, it's really uh, an app for everyone. And um, at the same time, we also have uh, participants from over 120 countries from all over the world. Uh, you can see all the countries in green in this picture. And uh, to this day, we've had over 17,000 uh, citizen scientists um, in Nurika, whose data we were able to use. So uh, that's quite a lot of people. And uh, we're really happy to uh, have so many. And at the same time, we're still looking for more. Um, so uh, let me now talk about how you can help us. So uh, basically, when you download the app, um, there's a lot of different science challenges that you can compete with in it. And Everything that you feed into the app, every minute that you spend playing or learning or tracking helps us uh, move the needle forward on the research of brain health. So uh, every, everything, um, every interaction that you have with the app is really useful. And there's different ways that you can interact with the app. So um, 
firstly, I'll talk about playing. So there's actually quite a few mini games um, in the app and uh, I'll show you some examples. So uh, for example, here, this is Memory Match, which is um, a game in which you have to memorize symbols and then uh, pick them from a grid and try to get as many correct as you can. So uh, this is a test of your short-term memory. And um, we also have another game here. This is my personal favorite, that's Cannon Blast, um, in which you um, take over a cannon and try to uh, shoot your balls <laughs> towards this diamond here and try to hit the diamond um, and uh, get points that way. And uh, this is actually, um, a way to assess uh, decision-making, how you make decisions in complex situations. And uh, then um, another example of a game that I have here is Star Racer. And in Star Racer, um, you just have to tap stars in ascending order. And uh, this is a measure of your processing speed. And the interesting thing about all these games is that they're actually based off, uh, they're based on existing tasks that psychologists have been using to assess brain health. Um, so usually those would be either tasks that people do at a computer, or it would be tasks that you can do uh, with a pen and paper. But uh, we try to make them uh, much more fun and engaging. And at the same time, uh, they're, also, um, they're also a bit shorter, so uh, much more easier to do. So for example, when you're waiting in a queue uh, or waiting for the bus or just bored at home, um, this is definitely something that you can do. And um, another really um, important thing is that um, we also have a set of questionnaires about different topics, such as demographics or health or your attitudes towards things. And um, we can then use uh, the data from these questionnaires and link it with your performance on the games. And this way we can, uh, we can learn about the characteristics of people who um, play the games. And um, for example, we can see um, how performance on the games is related to those different characteristics, um, such as here is an example with memory match. So that was the first game that I showed you, the one with memory. Um, so uh, we have been able to see that uh, better memory uh, measured with memory match was linked to better hearing, less smoking and higher education, which are the risk factors that I have uh, shown you earlier. So uh, we are so far replicating uh, findings from previous research, which is very important, but at the same time, uh, as a next step, we'll be able to look at those very interesting relationships of the different uh, risk factors. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, then the next thing that you can do with Nureka is actually to also learn something uh, useful for yourself. So um, we have a set of science challenges within Nureka, which um, are more um, about educating our users. And um, so, for example, the first one, uh, maintain your brain, um, is basically a quiz in which you can learn new stuff about how you can decrease your risk of dementia. Um, and how you can preserve your brain health. Um, so we always get feedback um, and learn new stuff. And uh, then the other challenge that I will point out is read all about it. So um, there's some crazy fake news and misinformation out there, especially in the science world. And we just want to teach you to be science savvy. Um, and uh, you can do, you can learn that uh, with read all about it because um, will help you understand a bit better how to, um, yeah, understand a bit better um, when some research findings are presented in uh, newspapers, for example, uh, they might actually, um, yeah, so we just want to um, help you understand um, research findings. Oh, sorry, period. Um, and then uh, another part that we have, another challenge that we have is remember this, where you can learn about um, Alzheimer's disease and uh, dementia generally. Um, so that's also very interesting if you would like to learn more about those uh, disorders. So then lastly, you can also use Nureka for self-tracking um, to help you uh, learn insights um, about your own behaviors and mood, and at the same time, uh, still help move science forward. So um, we have 
a set of challenges that enable you to monitor your mood or your cognition or your habits, and then also to uh, track changes in those things over time. Um, so for example, multi-mood here, um, this is a challenge in which um, you're given a really short uh, mood questionnaire um, twice a day for, I think it's six weeks. And uh, you can then actually get a personalized graph uh, that'll show you how your symptoms or how your mood is changing over time. And uh, this can be very informative for yourself if you wanna learn about um, what impacts your mood or um, yeah, how it fluctuates. And then we also have another uh, challenge which is called Brain Changer. This one looks about how mood is related to your thinking abilities. And then lastly, we have Pattern Wise as well, which is uh, very useful for tracking habits um, such as uh, phone checking, um, etc. cetera. So, um, I've mentioned tracking, so maybe a question that can pop up uh, is what actually happens with your data and how do we handle privacy with Eureka? Um, so uh, let me first say that we are fully GDPR compliant, that is we are compliant with the European uh, data protection laws, which are pretty strict. So um, you have the chance to opt out from participating in research at any point or opt out from email communication and e even erase your data, download your data. And uh, your data is not going to be um, shared with, uh, with anyone else um, in an unidentifiable format. So um, because we want to publish the findings of our research, we do publish uh, our studies together with data, but this data is always in a non-identifiable format again. Um, if you, however, have any questions or concerns about us, uh, feel free to reach out. And um, we have this email address here, admin uh, at neureka.ie, but we also have um, a Twitter account and a website with a blog where we're uh, trying to share um, our findings um, or what we're working on. So if you're interested to learn more, uh, feel free to hop on that website or on the Twitter account and check it out. And uh, yeah, so there's two more slides that I have. So firstly, uh, Neureka is a really promising tool, both for um, the clinic potentially and also for research. So uh, the great thing that it can improve uh, self-management by increasing insight and awareness and it can give you a reliable overview of your own well-being but also teach you a bit about what you can do to uh, preserve your brain health in the long term. Um, tools like Neureka could also one day enable to predict and detect who is at an increased risk of poor brain health which is useful for uh, prevention interventions and ultimately um, Research using Eureka will inform public health policies and help us improve brain health globally. So that's kind of the, uh, the long-term goal that we have uh, regarding our research findings. And um, I would also like to briefly talk about the next steps and what we have planned for Eureka for the future. So we're definitely, we continue on improving the technology and developing it further. We have a new science challenge coming up uh, early next year, hopefully. and. Uh, we definitely won't stop there. So uh, there's new science coming into Eureka and it's uh, meant as a platform for um, a lot of different research uh, in the future. Um, another thing that's quite important for us is to engage other researchers. So this application is um, open access. That means that other researchers, if they wish, they could um, use the application for their own studies to use it as a way to assess brain health. And uh, we are also um, linking um, our work with other studies. So for example, um, some other researchers would like to use Neureka as an add-on thing in their research. So that's definitely also possible. Um, and lastly, um, we're also trying um, to get a bit more global. So our next destination is going to be Latin America. We're actually, uh, we actually started um, this September on localizing Eureka to Spanish, because it's very important to also look at um, some non 
westernized non-European uh, populations when we do research. And uh, yeah, so that's the plan. And I think that's all that I have here. Uh, I think I'm gonna hand the word over to Anna again, the awesome. other Anna. <laughs> if I manage to unshare my screen. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, well, I just yeah. have a little more fun for you. Um, I'll share my screen again, Here's my puppy again. Okay, so wait a minute. Ooh, actually, Anna, if you go back to that slide, yeah. really quick, the yeah. affiliation one. Yeah, hold on. I'm going to move it for anyone who's looking at this app and thinking, OK, this is super cool. I, I want to get involved. Um, it's tracked through SciStarter, too. So you can see how often you contribute to it, um, which is what this page explains for how to set up. So if you wanted to um, put it through your SciStarter account, um, you can do that as long as you use the exact same email address as your SciStarter account. So if any of you are thinking like, OK, I'm downloading right now. Before you make the account, make sure it's the same email because then you'll be able to see how often you participate and uh, get credit for the the work that you or the the data that you um, that you contribute. Awesome. All right. Sorry, just wanted to mention yeah. that. Part. No, it's all good. Also, I heard a rumor that like right when you sign up for Narika, it maybe doesn't show up right away, and that you have to like keep playing a little bit before it shows up. I did not test that, but um, just thought I'd mention that in case anybody runs into that. Um, also, I'll mention that SciStarter does not see your like Nurika data oh. at all. Like SciStarter does not get the answers to your surveys about your mental health or anything like that. It's just like this person participated in Nurika and did a, did a survey, played a game, whatever it is. Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't want it. <laughs> Uh, cool. So I just wanted to do a little walkthrough of Narika, like what it was like for me going in as a first timer, um, figuring out how to do it. So let's go. So to get started, we already mentioned this, but I'll show you what it looks like. So this is the Narika page on SciStarter. Um, Narika is a SciStarter affiliate, which just means that, um, it will track your site so will track your participation so you get credit on your dashboard um if you are looking at this page all you need to do to get started is click on this blue participate web button um, you might also get lost and find the regular Nurika project page which is also totally fine to use um so projects that are not affiliates and projects that are affiliates all also have just a regular old project page so you can also access Narika through this, um, in which case you're going to hit the visit button, also a blue button, which is there on the left. So when you hit the blue button, it takes you to the Narika homepage, which looks like this, super easy. So at this point, you're going to say, wait, Anna, I'm on my desktop. Sorry, you got to do this on your phone. <laughs> Um, so you can also just directly search for the Narika app um, in your app store. That's what I did after I did this on the computer and thought, oh, shoot, I can't do this on my computer. Um, and it's totally fine. It's a really fun app. It's worth having the app if you are a, even if you're a desktop computer person like me. Um, here's what it looks like in the Play Store. Just go ahead and download it. So logging into the app, I just gave it my SciStarter account email. It was super easy to sign up. Um, and then I appreciated there was a bunch of pages that sort of explain like what the data is going to be used for, um, things like this. Um, they'll never share my information, etc., cetera, et cetera. That's great. Love it. Thank you. There's also a note right in the app about how to get credit for SciStarter, which I loved. Um, so there's a little more information about that that pops up in the app. These are these are literally screenshots from yeah. Um, and then it just brings you to the Narika app homepage once you're in. And it looks like this. If you scroll down, there's like a bunch of challenges. I was amazed that there were so many different things to choose from. Um, at this point, I was like, well, what the heck am I supposed to do? But then I got an email in my inbox. Look at this. It said, hi, thanks for downloading Narika. 
blah, 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 blah. Please do risk factors challenge first. So I really appreciated this direction because I was overwhelmed. I was like, do I just start at the beginning? Do I just click on the first one? Whatever. So I loved the email that was like, please do the risk factors one. Um, if I go back, um, that was one of the, the first ones at the top. So let's do it. We can do risk factors. Thanks for clicking on your first science challenge. You're welcome, Narika. Um, this is all about helping researchers find new ways to detect dementia early. We'll play three games, um, which Anna already showed us, complete 10 questionnaires. I read that, I was like, oh, this is gonna take forever, but it didn't take forever. It was pretty quick um, and painless. It was fun. The games were fun. The questionnaires were just like, did you have hearing loss? Which was easy to um, choose the answers. Anyway, I'll show you a little bit of this. So um, Star Racer, I think was actually my favorite game. I don't know. I liked the diamond shooter. Um, I should have timed myself to see if it actually took me six minutes, but I was too, too engrossed. Um, so when you click on a game for the first time, or maybe every time it explains how to play pretty well, there's like a series of screens that are like, uh, walk you through how to do it. So select the stars in order, one, two, three, as fast as you can. Once you click on them, they turn pink, which is helpful. So you don't lose your place. Um, if it's incorrect, the star will turn red and shake. Um, also, if you're taking too long, the last one you clicked on will shake a little too. So it'll be like the last one was three, you're looking for four, um, which was also a good reminder. It gets harder. This one through eight is like easy peasy compared to how hard it actually gets. So it's fun. So one of the ways they make it harder is adding letters. So you have to go one, A, two, B, three, C, and so on, which is easy for those three. But once you're on like G, you're like G11, what, where, what number did I leave off on? Um, which is the point, it's, that's like harder to keep track of where you left off. See how that could help test your brain function. Um, I wanted to give you more screenshots from the game, but I'm like, it's timed. I can't, I'm not gonna waste my precious seconds on my screenshots. So anyway, you just get the introduction slides, but it's super fun. I like this game. Um, I think I did, this was my score. I wanted, I was gonna be like, Anna, is this a good score? No, you don't tell me, don't tell me. You're gonna be like, oh no, Anna Funk's cognition is, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, something else I really like about the app is that once you're done, playing a game or I, I think filling out a survey, I can't remember, definitely on the games, it tells you what it does after you're done playing. So that was really fun for me. Um, I know sometimes like sciencey games, you can be like, I don't see the, I don't see the connection between what this actually does. So it tells you what the game is actually assessing um, and why, which is super fun. Um, I just wanted to show an example of what one of the surveys looked like too. Um, this was the hearing survey. I'm glad I'm going to, I want to ask more about the hearing and dementia connection later because I have not heard of that as a risk factor. And even when I got the survey, I was like, I don't know what this has to do with anything. But um, anyway, really easy to answer questions. Um, almost all the surveys, it'll give you some sort of rating scale at the beginning. Um, ask you a bunch of questions about your own experiences. Um, it was pretty good. Memory Match was another game I played, which was definitely the hardest one. I don't know if it's the hardest for everyone, but man, the symbols. Once, once this, once you get like three symbols, it's like I don't know. I I found myself trying to think of like cheat phrases like I'd be like I'd see this something like this I'd be like blue star purple n or just like anything anything that could come to mind quickly to help me remember it. I felt like I was cheating but I don't know that's how I remembered it um yeah so then you have to pick them out and sometimes you think like you think you have it memorized but then there's five other shapes that are close and you're like oh crud so anyway it was really fun really hard now let's make things difficult. Oh, sure. Thanks. Four symbols, all different colors was brutal, especially because oh, I don't have the full spread. So 
then when you get when you get your full spread that you're choosing from, like all four colors are there. There will be the same colors, but the different symbols there. So you have to remember which symbol was which color. It was hard. It was hard. It was fun. It was good. Felt like I was using my brain. Cool. Um, the app was very encouraging. I liked all the shout outs. Um, gave me a medal when I was done. Yeah, that was about it. So I just wanted to show you like how cool and easy the app is to use. Um, did I not give you any questions, any pictures of the diamond shooter? The diamond shooter is really just, you just gotta play it. Um, what Anna showed us is all you need to know, but um, yeah, that one I think feels the most like, a, like it is a real game. Like it's not, it's not like this is, re this is research and we're pretending like it's a fun game, but it's not, not that anybody else does that. But the diamond shooter was like actually a fun game. Like I would totally just play that all the time. And now I do because I have the Nurika app. Okay, um, that is plenty of talking from me. I want to go back to Anna and have her answer some of your questions. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A yet, so I will just ask my questions to start us off while you guys put your questions in. Um, can you tell us more, Anna, about the link between hearing loss and dementia? Why is that a connection? Um, yeah. Thanks for the question. That's a yeah. really interesting one. And uh, actually, uh, we don't know exactly what the mechanism is at the moment. We just know that people who have uh, sensory impairments and who have hearing loss specifically yeah. are more likely to develop dementia later on. And we actually have some evidence that even like uh, wearing hearing aids, um, if you have a hearing impairment, uh, might be beneficial. Um, but the problem is that we still don't understand the mechanisms and there's some hypotheses about why this might be. So actually one of them is that it's um, when people um, have a hearing impairment, which is not corrected, uh, then people actually have fewer social interactions and become more mm -hmm. isolated or potentially depressed. Um, and that might actually uh, be kind of an, have an indirect und effect then uh, on their uh, brain health because social interactions, as we know, are very important um, for aging people, especially. Um, and another hypothesis is that there might actually be some uh, like parts of the brain um, that um, if they're impaired, uh, they result both in brain problems, like um, problems with thinking abilities, but mm -hmm. also with, uh, they also might result in problems with hearing. So, um, we don't know exactly yet, mm -hmm. but there are some hypotheses about it. I actually might uh, try to look at this as part of my PhD. I don't know yet. <laughs> cool. What about the link between depression and dementia? Is that like a mechanistic brain link or is that one affecting the other? Yeah, if, so... If you know. <laughs> yeah, we know that... Um, there's a lot of comorbidity. So people with uh, depression are more likely to have dementia and vice versa. But uh, we that's another thing where we do not have an exact answer as of now. So this is why you should uh, try to do the risk factors challenge in Eureka and help us <laughs> do this kind of research. But it's really um, like, yeah, it's, it's not fully understood to this point. Um, yeah. One more app Sorry. question. So some of the some of the challenges you can do over and over again, like the mood tracker and some like the risk factors, I'm guessing you only do once. We actually recently right? uh, introduced a feature where people can retake the risk factors uh -huh. because uh, we're inviting people to uh, do that after two years, which is also uh -huh. really exciting to just see how uh, the first assessment uh, predicts your brain health at a later stage. Yeah. Um, so that's an ongoing project. Um, but yeah, I think for, I'm not really sure. I think uh, some of the challenges, they, they should be, some, most of them should be a bit doable. Yeah. I'm not sure if all of them are though. I, I'm not sure myself. Yeah. Okay. okay. Just sorry. sorry. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I was just trying to remember. Okay, cool. Emma, I know you had some questions. 
I do. Um, I also see one in the Q and A. So oh, and great. it's related. So I wanted to bring that up as well. Uh, Trevor, thank you for sharing. Can you describe the process of creating the various games? Uh, what went into developing the games to yield accurate data? And my question that was tied to that one um, was: I just wanted to remember what you said about. I remember you said processing speed was the star racer one and then I wasn't positive about the other like how does memory is memory like cognitive function just if you could explain those again that would be awesome okay okay so starting with Trevor's question here uh yeah thanks for that so um basically um um I personally wasn't involved in uh, developing the three games that I showed you or any of the games whatsoever but I see my friends uh, or colleagues in the lab uh, working on the games and developing uh, new challenges and uh, it's a lot of um, back and forth with our developer and we have a very kind uh, um, designer who's helping us prepare like design all those uh, yeah just make those beautiful designs and animations and um, yeah so uh, I personally uh, cannot tell much about how exactly that works. Um, but what I can tell you about is that we obviously have to make sure that the games measure what we want them to measure. So we have to validate them. And uh, for that, we always invite people to do, um, if the game is based on an original task, to do the original task and uh, also do uh, the module or, or the game in the Eureka. And then we look at how uh, their data correlates between those two things. So um, we have uh, done validation studies of the existing tasks. Um, that's very important to make sure that um, our games actually reflect, um, yeah, assess what we want them to assess. Um, yeah, and uh, coming to your question, Emma. Um, so you were asking uh, if I could go back to the different things that we measure with the games or? Uh... Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, uh, so um, so cognition, that's basically all different thinking abilities that you might have. So uh, that's kind of like a um, an umbrella term for um, all the things that you saw today. So it includes uh, memory as well uh, and uh, the other two games and um, yeah, I don't know how much uh, more I should say about it. There's a lot of different like things that uh, fall under uh, condition, uh, sorry, cognition. And uh, yeah, each is assessed in a slightly different way. Even like uh, if you go visit a psychologist, uh, then uh, they have different tests for those things. Um, another thing also like um, with all those games, obviously you don't always use just one cognitive ability, uh, just like one area of cognition. So for example, for a uh, memory match where you were like, uh, that was the memory te uh, test or memory game, uh, you have to not only remember the shapes, but also be able to pay attention to the shapes when they appear and be able to quickly scan through some uh, stimuli mm -hmm. that you're being shown. So that's also like processing speed goes into that as well. But we know from uh, studies that uh, had people do um, a memory, task like this one uh, with other existing memory tasks um, and that way we have been able to validate uh, the tasks and make sure that they actually assess uh, the specific areas. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm making sense at the moment if I'm answering your question, but no, you're making total sense. Um, I appreciate that. I, I am curious, so for the type of cognition that's assessed for the diamond um, canon, is that like yeah. logic related or? Pardon? Logic related, you said? Yeah, I'm just not sure how it's, like I wasn't, because it is, it feels like a game. And so when you're playing it, you're like, what is this even assessing? I don't, I mean, yeah. it's. <laughs> yeah, so um, actually for this one, um, so um, the thing is when you're playing this, this game, you have um, basically, you have to choose uh, what color of balls you shoot. Uh, those can be either blue or pink and, uh, there's some pro like some of the balls um, explode before they actually reach the diamond. Oh yeah, thank you for showing that. That's perfect. <laughs> Thanks for screen sharing. Uh, if you tap once more, it's gonna show the animation. I think. There you go. Yeah. So on the right, uh, for example, uh, there's like 
you can see that this one didn't explode for it. But if you have a blue ball or purple ball, then it's more likely to explode at the moment. Uh, so it's basically about, sorry, I'm not, <laughs> not sure if I'm explaining it correctly, but uh, there's some probability uh, linked to each uh, of the two sides. And uh, we're basically trying to assess how people evaluate those probabilities when they play the game. So for example, if you see that, uh, if you choose the right side balls all the time uh, and you see that they explode before they even reach the diamond, then you should probably switch to the other side. Um, so we're basically looking at how, uh, good are people how good people are at um noticing those probabilities and working with them if that makes sense so it's it's quite a complex task and it's about how people uh work with probabilities in complicated situations that's fascinating i also mm -hmm. i remember playing this game when i first tried and definitely was one of those people who's like ah oh, directions nah skip skip skip, skip. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah play. And so mm -hmm. I definitely messed it up, but I, it took me a long, or it took me a while to figure out like, oh, there is, a, there's definitely some, like I should be choosing to switch. Like when it took me a minute. So I don't know if I missed the directions yeah. or if that was the point. I'm just like terrible at identifying <laughs> what the probability is, which is highly likely. I won't lie, but, yeah, but it's one of those things where I'm just like, like, why is it but there's breaking if it's this side? I don't understand. <laughs> Well, uh, there's actually some research uh, using a similar task that looked at how people are able to understand uh, what they're actually, what they're supposed to do in the task without any instructions and if that like uh, makes them better at it or yeah, how that impacts their choices. So uh, yeah, and this task is actually uh, very interesting because um, it's also, um, yeah, it's it seems to be like, we expect that uh, people with impairments in a part of their brain uh, that is called the hippocampus, which is related to uh, memory, among others. Um, so people who have impairments in this part of the brain um, have been shown to uh, perform kind of differently on this task. Uh, I won't get into the details, uh, but um, so this is really interesting because this area of the brain also is one of the first to go in dementia. So uh, we see that this task might be really uh, a new way to detect some very early impairments related to dementia. Um, so yeah, that's why it's very fascinating. I have so many questions that'll just take up so much time and I will definitely be emailing you questions. Um, for sake of time though, because we are at 11.50, or sorry, I'm on the wrong time zone. It's, we're about six minutes out from the hour. Nobody's on the same time zone here. It's fine. Yeah, I saw in the, in the chat, someone is in Greece. So I'm assuming we're on all totally different. <laughs> Welcome. Um, awesome. Okay. This is just, I love brain studies. Like this is just so fascinating because it just opens up so many areas. I, before this meeting, we were discussing how the second we bring up mental health or like brain related things, it brings up so many personal stories. Um, and I'm going to use that as a segue real quick, uh, just to get a little bit of information from you, just because um, we're so grateful that you came to join us. And we kind of want to know what what's the deal? Why are you uh, here? Like, why is this what you chose to be um, your studies, especially since it's tied to your PhD, th um, like theoretically? I want to know and tell everyone else um, what brought you here. Yeah, so uh, I would say that the short answer is that I like brains um, and I uh, have been a fan of brains for quite a while um, during uh, university. And um, I was like, yeah, it would be so cool to do something neuroscience related. Um, and um, at the same time, I kind of uh, really like uh, working on research projects where I can see an impact. So uh, something related to mental health or dementia or aging, and how can we make lives easier, easier to people who suffer from uh, mental illnesses or uh, dementia, for example. So um, that's been like uh, something that I find really interesting. And uh, another area of my interest is uh, how we actually can use uh, smart technologies to uh, advance this. Um, so uh, when I saw the project, uh, the PhD project that was uh, about Norica and uh, about basically a health tech uh, tool that uh, we can use to uh, for, for brain health research, I was like, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. So uh, I just went for it. And yeah, that's how I end up, ended up here. Mitchell. <laughs> 
Yeah, in short, I'm sure there's <laughs> lots and lots that goes into decisions like this. So I appreciate yeah. you. Yeah. Um, simple. Um, that's awesome. So uh, for sake of time, I'm going to skip along. Um, assuming that this project um, completes all its goals and is like the optimal level of success, what do you think that the future would look like in a world where this does all of its roles that are proposed? Yeah, so I see this as a kind of a proof of concept for the future when I can imagine that if you, for example, uh, want to assess your brain health um, and are worried either about your memory deteriorating or you just want to, uh, you have, have been feeling unwell and you want to uh, go to therapy, we might actually implement uh, the technologies around us to help us with those things to assess our brain health in the first place. So I can imagine um, that we could um, just um, use a smartphone app to uh, fill in a few questionnaires before we even seek a, seek out a clinician and they would be able to like recommend us the next steps or uh, even administer some treatment via a smartphone and um, it's not so that I want people to be tied to the screens all the time but I just think it's very practical um, to be able to do this kind of assessments remotely um, so that's something that I uh, hope is going to be the future um, if everything works out, yeah. That's awesome. That also is one of those things that brings up a million questions to me, and I'm going to pause to make sure that doesn't happen. But again, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Anna, I'll let you. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, we are almost out of time. So, Anna, thank you so much for joining us today. We just have a couple announcements before we let y'all go. Um, so I will share my screen again so I can remember my announcements are haha so we have more upcoming science starter live events as always we're doing this once a week so hopefully some of you can join us next tuesday um next week we're learning about data literacy which is just all about understanding how to understand numbers that you hear um what they mean it's more interesting than it sounds i promise um data literacy is like really fundamental to just like I don't know, being a good human in society. I think I'm very pro data literacy. Um, and then on the 25th, we have not confirmed our special guest yet, but we are going to have a Halloween special of some sort. So stay tuned for more details there. Um, when we have more details, they will be posted on the SciStarter Live page, which is on our blog at blog.sistarter.org. It's the first post pinned to the top of the page. And also Roman will probably drop it in the chat if he hasn't already, but he has. Um, last but certainly not least, just wanna make sure everyone knows about some of SciStarter's other resources um, in case you ever need help or want to do more or whatever. So if you are stuck on a specific project, one thing you can do is ask the SciStarter community. So every project page has like a comment section. You can leave a review and say, I love this project. I hated this project. No, you won't hate the project. Um, or you can ask a question that somebody can answer. Anybody who sees it can answer. Um, you can also reach out to project leaders anytime you are stuck or have a question. So uh, again, on a SciStarter project page, there is a button on the left-hand side that says message project. I believe that sends an email straight to their inbox. Don't quote me on that, but um, it does get a message to the project leaders. Um, if that doesn't work, you can always reach out to SciStarter. You can also just start with SciStarter first because we exist to help you. So email info at SciStarter.org anytime you are stuck on anything at all. Um, they'll either help you or tell you who to ask. Um, we already talked about our trainings. Um, really recommend doing the trainings if you want to boost your um, citizen science know-how. Um, and once you're ready to find more projects, just go to scistarter.org slash finder and browse through all of the gazillions of 